a minute, we'll just turn it over to, to Wojciech and he will talk about some some really neat uh, things. Uh, what he's going to discuss is about uh, Codec 2 uh, and optimizing Codec 2 for to make it sound better because our goal is to have our voice products and in, in amateur radio digital communications to sound as good as they possibly can. And we've heard we've been getting a lot of feedback that um, the M17 voice quality could be better. And Wojciech's really kind of like dug in here and, and is going to present some some ways that we can look at uh, this challenge and maybe um, publish some some really good work that'll that'll help us. All right, so please take it away, Wojciech. Okay, so hello again. Greetings. My name is Wojciech Kaczmarski and I'm the current uh, project lead in M17 Project. And also I am a ham radio operator uh, under the call sign SP5WWP. Okay, so we can get started. Uh, and today's presentation is about uh, quantizer optimi optimization for Codec 2. And Codec 2 is based on LPC, uh, linear predictive coding. So it's a very popular uh, framework for voice coding. Uh, Codec 2 is a free to use and open source uh, voice codec that has been developed by David Rowe, VK5 DJ, DGR, and David is also ham radio operator. And uh, a lot of mostly ham radio operators helped him in development, that voice coder. And we are going to focus on the full rate mode, which is uh, 3200 bits per second. And it gives already a uh, good quality voice, but not as good as it can as we will see later. So how is the speech modeled and what is speech? Uh, speech is just a sound pressure wave that is generated by our vocal cords and it gets filtered by the vocal tract and uh, gets output from our mouth and nose. Uh, so we've got like an excitation source and the filter and then the signal output. And uh, the problem is that uh, for short periods of time, uh, the excitation uh, stays the same, is stationary. We call this a uh, linear uh, time invariant model. Uh, so the excitation uh, is changing over time, just as the filter does. So we can say that uh, even if we said a letter A over, let's say, half a second, it's going to be the same pitch and the filter uh, made by the vocal tract. Uh, so we can track uh, those changes and we have to do it to uh, reconstruct speech accurately. Uh, and we can model uh, the speech generation process, just as I said, by using an excitation source and a filter. So this is a mathematical model for the speed generation. And this is how speech signal looks like. And this is a sample from our uh, community manager, Edward Wilson, N2XDD, uh, saying probably M17. Uh, this is a sample of his voice. So uh, we see that uh, there is a difference between uh, vowel sounds and uh, sibilants, because sibilants have uh, a high amount of zero crossings. So for sibilance, we just have a pressure wave that comes from the lungs and gets filtered by uh, the vocal tract. But there is no uh, there is no uh, vocal cord action in this. So it's not voiced. We call that unvoiced speech. So like saying s, like s or f that's unvoiced speech. And then there's a fragment of voice which is voiced and you can see clearly that uh, the zero, zero crossing uh, uh, number is decreased and the pitch is visible. And the pitch is uh, just the difference between those samples right here. So it's the fundamental frequency for this fragment. And you can see that it changes over time. It's not constant. Uh, because the difference between those two, those two peaks is different than those two peaks. Uh, 
and this is the same speaker. Uh, and this sample is 200 milliseconds long, so you can have a notion on uh, how fast the rate of change is for a sample speech. Now, let's get back to the uh, mathematical model of speech synthesis. So, uh, in the real world, we've got vocal cords and lungs as the excitation source and vocal tract as the filter. And the mouth and nose is the output of the signal. Now, the mathematical model uh, tells us that uh, you can use an excitation source, which is just uh, either a, a pulse train for voiced uh, sounds like A uh, or E, uh, or you can have a, a random source uh, of random signal, I mean um, a noise signal that is filtered to produce sibilants like S or F. Uh, and then we have signal output, which is uh, just a time series of some values. Uh, now, the filter that is a uh, mathematic, mathematical model of the vocal tract can be uh, approximated with an all-pole digital filter of order P. And usually, and in codec 2, the P is equal to 10. So we've got up to five formants. Uh, we can represent up to five formants. So a formant, I will get back to this later. Uh, so this is the filter uh, transfer functions, uh, transfer function, H of Z. And this is how uh, 20 milliseconds of speech look like. And this is taken from the previous sample. So clearly, uh, it's visible that this is a uh, voice speech because there is a quasi-periodic si uh, signal. Uh, and this is 20 milliseconds of speech. Uh, yeah. Now, what Codec 2 does is that it extracts uh, the filter coefficients A in this equation in the denominator AK, and there are 10 uh, parameters A, 10 coefficients for each frame. So uh, you have to uh, compute autocorrelation values for the speech frame and then use uh, a recursive algorithm called Levinson Darbin algorithm to solve a set of linear equations to obtain. Uh, a parameters from the speech sample. And this is how it looks like. And uh, the blue one, the blue uh, curve, or it's piecewise linear, but let's say it's a curve. So the blue plot is uh, the discrete Fourier transform of the speech input. And you can see that the red curve is approximating the um, spectral envelope of the signal. And the red uh, curve is actually the frequency response of the A of Z filter, uh, sorry, H of Z filter, which we just modeled right here. So first we've got the speech frame, then we extract A parameters from that frame, and it gives us a filter like this. So to describe this, uh, red curve, we use 10 A parameters coefficients. And this is a polynomial uh, representation of the vocal tract and its filter. Now, the other uh, method of uh, describing the filter is to use line spectral frequencies called LSF for short. Now, mm, when we if we want, if we wanted to transmit parameters a, coefficients a, from one place to another over an RF link or something, the problem is that uh, those coefficients are very sensitive to errors, and even a one percent error might make this filter unstable or the speech intelligible, unintelligible. So this is not good. Uh, so the solution for that problem is to convert the set of 10 
a parameters into 10 line spectral frequencies, which describe the same thing, but uh, LSFs are less uh, susceptible to errors. So this is that plot again, uh, that red curve. And you can see that uh, those dashed lines represent uh, line spectral frequencies, and they come in pairs because uh, when we say, let's say, uh, <laughs> let's assume that this is uh, the frequency response of a letter A or a phoneme A, because this, this is not a letter, this is a phoneme, uh, we can see that uh, for our brains, it's important to, um, it's important to have all those bumps in the right places. So those bumps are called formants. And uh, using 10 LSFs or five LSPs, when where uh, LSP is line spectra pair, uh, you can uh, represent five up to five formants, and you can see clearly that uh, this plot has four. Uh, the first one is very pronounced because uh, those two LSFs are very close together. So the closer together are those LSFs, the higher the peak is. Uh, and this is the second one. This is the third one. This is very less, very, uh, not very pronounced. And there is also one here, which is almost invisible, but it's right here. It's because those two LSFs are very far away from each other. So to have good, intelligible voice, you have to know where each formant is. So the formant is just the bump, remember. You have to know where the bump is, how high is the peak, and uh, that's, pr that's pretty much it for intelligible voice. And uh, also, it's good to have this valley as low as possible. So the one of the limitations of the LSF representation of the uh, spectral envelope of the signal is that this valley is not low enough, but we can do anything about it using uh, line prediction coding, uh, linear prediction coding, sorry. And this is just another representation of the previous plot when w where we have uh, five pairs, five conjugate pairs of poles of the all pole filter. And you can see that it's indeed all pole filter because all of the zeros are at the origin. And the red circles uh, represent line spectral frequencies. So right here on the right hand side, we've got a DC component. And we go right up here when where we have the Nyquist frequency. So somewhere about here we've got two kilohertz because the Nyquist frequency is four kilohertz. Uh, this is just because uh, the most used sample rate in uh, audio processing, uh, speech processing is eight kilohertz. That's a standard. Now, how to encode LSFs? How Codec2 encodes LSFs? Uh, the first LSF well, every LSF is just a frequency from the range of 0 to 4 kilohertz. Let's take a look at this plot again. So we have to transmit from one place to another a set of 10 numbers. And we can say that those are integers. Uh, 10 numbers to transmit. So how to do it efficiently? Uh, codec 2. Uh, does it like this. Uh, the first LSF is encoded as a codebook entry uh, from a, uh, one of, it uses 10 codebooks. <laughs> the first one is used, is used to encode LSF1, and it does it like this. Uh, LSF input is compared to every single entry from that codebook, and that codebook is it has 32 entries. So we look it up uh, in the table, in the code, uh, in the code book. 
And for example, let's say that the first LSF was 145 Hertz. So the closest one is 150. And what Codec 2 does, it, it actually um, subtracts every value from the codebook from, uh, sorry, it, uh, it subtracts the input from every uh, codebook entry and sees what's the difference between them and picks the one that is the closer, the closest one to the input. Uh, so in our case, it's 150. And of course, we don't transmit that it was 150. We just transmit the index of that entry. So in our case, it would be six. Uh, so that's for the LSF one, the first LSF. So we've got nine more to go. And the next one, uh, well, the next step works like this. We've got LSF. Uh, it should say LSF, but uh, David Rowe uses names like this. So I'm consistent with that. Uh, so the first LSF was quantized to the value of 150 Hertz instead of 145, which was the original one. Now to tell, uh, now to search in the next codebook, you have to subtract the value of the second LSF. So you have to subtract 150. So this quantized value from the original one. So our input. And it shows that uh, it's 410 Hertz. So the closest one is 400. So uh, this is not, uh, I have omitted the beginning of this code book and the tail because there is not enough space to show it all, but it has 32 entries. Each of those code books has 32 entries. So to encode LSF1 and LSF2, we've got already two integers, two index, uh, two indices. The first index is six and the second one, let's say it's eight because we omitted some. And we continue up to LSF10. And in this way, we obtain 10 integers, 10 indices uh, to those code books. And this is how Codec2 encodes LSFs. Now, the question is, can we improve that? And it looks like very much can because uh, those scalar quantizers are not optimized for uh, the actual speed data. So we can either improve the scalar quantizer or move to vector quantizer. Uh, how to generate a good code book? So to generate it, we have to um, obtain a long sample of speech, and that's called speech corpus. And there are already prepared uh, like tens of gigabytes of speech, which can be downloaded for free and used for free. And one of the examples is OpenSLR, uh, and Ted Lyon is a part of OpenSLR, as far as I know. And I have used those to generate code books for codec two improvements. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this for a second. Okay, so let's take a look at the LSF2 minus LSF1 difference distribution. So this is a probability density function of this difference. And you can see that uh, the most probable uh, value is around 100 Hertz for this difference. And uh, the second plot, those points represent Codec2 reference codebook, which is the DLSP1 from this slide. So we've got uh, 32 entries of uh, values that are uh, spaced out by 25 Hertz. So it goes from 25 to around 800. I think that uh, the difference, yes, it's, it's uh, uniform. Uh, for the whole range. So it starts at 25 and ends at 800. So to uh, effectively encode all this information, you can uh, use the fact that some values have more probability of appearance than the other. 
and you can see that values uh, above 500 hertz have very low probability of appearance so it's pretty much a waste of time and waste of bits to have all of these codebook entries so it's better to have less codebook entries here and focus on this part which has really good chance of appearance uh, the next method is moving to vector quantizer so the previous part uh, used one dimensional quantizer called the scalar quantizer where we had uh, lsfs from one to ten and each LSF was encoded uh, separately. So we didn't have to group them into, let's say, three-dimensional or four-dimensional vectors. And in vector quantizing, uh, we do that. So uh, first of all, we have to group all 10 LSFs into three groups. And the first group is the LSF from one to three then from 4 to 6 and from 7 to 10. So the first vector is three-dimensional, the second sub-vector is also three-dimensional, and the last is four-dimensional. This is called the uh, split vector quantizer. So like you don't, uh, you don't treat all the LSFs like uh, as a 10-dimensional vector, and instead you split it into three smaller vectors. Uh, and the method I have used and I propose is that uh, I'm using, uh, first I'm using a course uh, code book for the initial guess for the vector. So I've got 64 entries, uh, a 10 dimensional uh, code book that is. Uh, so I've got 64 entries of 10 dimensional vectors and the, and I'm trying to find the best one uh, for my input vector uh, and after I found it after I find it uh, I move on to uh, the parts that are sub vectors of 3 3 and 4 dimensions so the beta allocation for the the proposed quantizer is that I'm using six bits for the course code book, which has uh, 64 in uh, 64 entries, and then four bits per stage for the split vector quantizer. And it's a multi stage uh, split vector quantizer because for each sub vector, I've got either three or four uh, stages. It's in the next uh, slide, I believe. So I've got three stages for LSF 1 to 3, four stages for LSF 4 to 6 to get a better approximation for those LSFs, and three stages for the last uh, four-dimensional part of the original LSF. And this gives 46 bits per frame, while Codec 2 uses 50 in its original scalar quantizer. And this is how it looks like. This is what you were <laughs> waiting for. Uh, so this is a set uh, of 64 10-dimensional vectors, which you, we use for the uh, course search. So we've got a 10-dimensional input, and we say we have to search uh, the, best, the best fit from this set. So let's say it was the first one. Then we split this vector, the uh, original one, uh, into three subparts, sub vectors. And the first one is uh, three dimensional, so LSFs from one to three. Uh, so what we do is we take the first three dimensions, the first three coordinates of the, uh, this code book, this, uh, this entry, and find the best uh, entry from this code book that approximates the input the best. And we uh, just follow this uh, multi-stage path until the last stage. And we do the same uh, for the next three, which has four stages, and the last four uh, dimensions 
and this time we have three uh, stages. Now, time for some math. Uh, to reconstruct the vector, uh, we let's go back here. Uh, to reconstruct the vector, uh, we obtain 11 coefficients. Well, not coefficients, but indices. So 9 from this part, uh, 10 from this part, and 11 from this part. So we've got 11 uh, indices to transmit, uh, to reconstruct the vector at the other side of the RF link. So this is how it's done, how the vector is reconstructed. Uh, so we just take the I0 entry from the Q0 code book and then add the uh, I1K where K is from one to the number of stages for the first part. So this is the first column. So we add up all those vectors, then add up the uh, another three dimensions and the last four dimensions of the LSF. So this is how the vector quantizer uh, works and this is how the vector is being um, reconstructed based on the indices. And this is how uh, the split vector quantizer uh, converges. So this is um, basically show, this basically shows how uh, the error is minimized. This is a two dimensional cross section for the uh, training set uh, for the Q2 code book. So uh, the red dots is just the difference between every Q, uh, Q2 code book entry uh, well it would be very difficult to see uh, that uh, the error uh, converges to the origin because the vector is three dimensional so it would be very very dark uh, so we see that at every stage uh, the error is uh, going to zero. And this is the error distribution for uh, codebook Q2. And we see that uh, it follows probably a Poisson distribution. And the peak is less than uh, five and five thousandths. And uh, this is like uh, the difference between the reconstructed vector. It's not the difference, it's the distance, the L2 norm for the reconstructed vector and uh, the one that we input. So we want to have zero, but of course we can't have zero because we have limited number of stages. If we had infinite number of stages or very big number of stages, uh, this plot would move to the left towards zero. Uh, but of course we can't have that because that's that would take a lot of time to compute all this stuff and a lot of memory to uh, to store this all those code books so let's see the results of uh, improving the scalar quantizer which is originally used in CADEC 2 uh, so when we improve uh, the code books for scalar quantizer uh, the good side is that the computational complexity stays the same because there are no additional computations to make. It's just uh, one time when uh, those code books are produced, uh, generated, and we don't have to do it again at any time. So you just distribute them over among the users and they just use it. Uh, the spectral distortion is reduced because <coughs> codebooks are uh, PDF optimized and PDF is the probability density function. So it's good to have PDF optimized codebooks as it 
minimizes the spectral distortion. And bitrate doesn't change because we still have 32 uh, code books, uh, 32 entries for every code book. So that's still the same amount of data. Now for the vector quantizer, it saves 200 bits per second uh, for each frame, uh, for each second. Because uh, for each frame, instead of having 50 bits allocated to LSFs, we've got 46. And that saves four bits and there are 40, 50 uh, uh, frames per second, which gives 200 bits per second gain. <clears throat> the cost is that uh, we have to do much more multi multiplications to find optimal vector and uh, the spectral distortion rises because there is a problem that uh, the code book uh, code books that we use are not optimized for uh, multi-stage vector quantizer uh, and that's just another topic uh, not covered today. Mm, I'm going to tell you more about this uh, probably next time, uh, as I have more results on the vector quantizer. Mm. Oh, and <clears throat> even if the spectral distortion rises, uh, it's not very perceptible because we are using low quality uh, speakers in handheld transceivers. So you have to have uh, really good headsets, uh, headphones to notice the difference. And this is a spectrogram for each uh, sample. The first one on the top uh, is the original sample from N2XDD. So this is his voice. And you can see that uh, uh, most of the energy is uh, in the lower frequencies, so below one kilohertz even. Now, the next one is uh, codec 2 encoded. So this is vanilla codec 2, the baseline for our research. So uh, you can see that there is some difference between uh, the original voice and codec 2 encoded voice. Like there is no uh, frequency components below, let's say, 100 hertz. This is just a blue line right here, a blue uh, blue part of the spectrum and we don't have it here it's just pink right to the DC uh, the next one is uh, improved scalar quantizer with PDF optimized codebooks and uh, it's pretty much similar to this one but uh, some parts are uh, some parts might be uh, reconstructed better, but it's pretty much hard to see any difference on the spectrogram. I would have to play uh, the sample, which I don't have right now. <laughs> it's on the other PC. Uh, but pretty much it looks the same as uh, Vanilla Codec 2. So visually, it looks pretty much the same. Now the vector quantizer uh, does pretty much bad job right here. And this is a vowel sound. Let's say it's A. Uh, so in the vanilla codec 2, you see that there are separate, uh, separate uh, signals right here, uh, harmonics. And right here, you just have a blob that resembles this, but it's not as good as uh, for example, this one or vanilla codec 2. So uh, the difference is imperceptible, but still it is there. But for 200 bits per second gain in compression, I think that's a good result. So that's it and thank you. Thank you very much, Wojciech. All right, so the floor is open for a short amount of time for questions. I'd like uh, to direct technical questions to the chat. That would be um, the good. So if you have a particular 
technical question about the presentation you've seen, uh, go ahead and post it in chat and, and Wojciech will answer there. If there is any um, advisory comments or questions uh, at a high level about the, the work, uh, the intention of the work or anything like that, then the floor is open for that uh, right now. So unmute and ask. Uh, this is Daniel with a question. I'm not sure exactly the category, but it's sort of a, a basic question regarding the codec. And that is the, one of the original assumption being that most of the speech is in the lower, lower hertz, lower frequency. But maybe the most important speech would be emergency speech or panicked speech whose frequencies are much higher. And at the time people need their communication most, the codec might fail because of the implicit assumption of low frequency. Is that something to be concerned about? No, I don't think so, because uh, it just looks like this on the spectrogram, but codec 2 doesn't care where the uh, energy is focused on, which range of frequency. So there is nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, any questions at all? Uh, totally welcome in, in chat for the rest of the session or at any time to anybody uh, involved. Um, but yeah, any advisory level input or advice for, for Wojciech would be uh, wonderful to hear now. This is Daniel again. I just want to applaud the progress that's being made in the codec. I think this is important work. So I, I give accolades. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. It's wonderful to hear. OK, Wojciech, please uh, uh, monitor chat to see if anybody has some questions. They'll probably be thinking about your presentation. And all the slides and the, the video and all of that will be available. Uh, we'll do our very best to, to make sure that we edit and record and present all of this. Um, so the next thing on the agenda is the M17 project. It's beyond root raised cosine filters. And what we've been talking about doing is optimizing filtering for M17 implementations because M17 wants to take full advantage of resource restricted hardware, um, that anything that can be done to make the, the RRCs uh, better or higher performance is of interest. Uh, so is anybody from M17 uh, would like to present or talk about this? I know that Fred Harris is very interested in this and wants to support it. He he wrote me an email and said he was having trouble getting into the meeting today. So I'm trying to help him over email. But would there would there be anybody that would like to talk about this a little bit more? Looks like I would have to tell, tell you about it. <laughs> oh yeah, well, go ahead. Please please do. That'd be that'd be wonderful. Okay, so I'm not uh, very familiar with this topic, but I know something about it, so I'm going to try and tackle it. So uh, the problem is that uh, when you have to transmit a bit stream using FSK, uh, it's very wise to uh, filter the baseband so that it doesn't occupy infinite bandwidth because uh, Imagine that you would have to um, transmit uh, a stream of zeros and ones using FSK. And let's say this is just a simple 2FSK method. So you've got frequencies F0 and F1. So if you just switch from one to the other, you would get a lot of frequency uh, a spectral splatter, let's say. So it's very wise to first uh, filter out the bit stream so those transitions take more time but less than the uh, symbol symbol time uh, and this is what we use in m17 and actually we use root raised cosine filter for that purpose uh, so when the baseband is formed we just take the uh, bit stream input uh, upscale it probably 10 times and then uh, apply root raised cosine filter at the transmitter. And the same thing uh, applies to the uh, at the receiver side. So for the uh, we just take the, the modulator the modulator output from the radio and then uh, apply the same filtering uh, at the receiver. So in general we are getting uh, zero intersymbol interference 
because we just effectively use two convolve filter which has uh, which have uh, zero zero isi uh, when convolved so the idea is to use uh, root raised cosine filter at the transceiver and at the receiver a transmitter and the receiver and the problem is that uh, the root raised cosine filter uses uh, uh, it doesn't have very good performance when compared to some other that has been pro uh, has been proposed by uh, someone on twitter and uh, someone proposed uh, that uh, a modified parks mcclellan method might be used to obtain a filter which has the, mm, the same performance but uses less taps and uh, with that uh, it means that it requires less computational complexity and does the same job basically so uh, the proposal is to use modified modified parks mcclellan method to obtain uh, new taps and use them uh, both at the transmitter and receiver side so this is probably everything that I have to say about this topic. Oh, thank you. I think that's a very solid summary. All right, so we'll follow up later on with uh, probably a more expanded uh, uh, if, uh, presentation um, on this p particular topic because we've, we've really just only started uh, looking at it. Any questions uh, from a, like an advisory point of view, uh, please go ahead and ask them. And if there's any technical questions about this particular part, then put them in the chat. Okay. All right. The next item on the agenda is Module 17. And uh, who is speaking about Module 17 today? Oh, someone says, give me a minute. It floated oh, across my screen. Matt. That's Matt. Oh, hello, Matt. Okay. Yes, uh, please. Uh, do you have the floor whenever you're ready? And if you need anything, just let me know. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and see you. My name is uh, Mattis or Matt, uh, DB9MAT, and um, I am currently working on Module 17. And um, just to, to show you what it is, uh, if I try to focus, um, so this is this is basically the the current development board for Module 17. And um, what the idea for this board is. Um, to, to be a device that is uh, running the OpenRTX firmware. And through that, uh, we'll be able to modulate and demodulate uh, M17. And um, the idea is to, to be able to connect this, this board um, to a uh, 9K6 board compatible um, radio, uh, be it a, a mobile radio or a handset and uh, to be yeah quite easily and cheaply be able to to transmit and receive m17 um currently we we went through three revisions so far so we're at at uh 0.1c um and it's it's looking promising so far um basic open rtx is running on it um the open rtx guys are um working on Getting the modulator and demodulator working on this on this module, so it it um, it shares the same microprocessor as the um, oh what are they called the the MD380 uh, radios are using. Um, so a, a lot can be reused. What what has been been written for that? Um, and yeah, so currently, um, what do you what the idea is for these ports is that you you connect a a speaker mic to it and use that to to transmit. Um, but the the goal for for the final revision is to have something in in this form factor, maybe maybe a bit bigger than than a so this is the usual Kenwood style speaker mic um, to yeah have a board in here 
uh, maybe a small display um, that you can can connect to your mobile radio and directly transmit and receive M17. Yeah, I think that's more or less it. Uh, what what I can show you without being being prepared. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please go ahead. I'd be oh, happy to answer them. Oh well, sure, yeah. Um, and if you if you haven't um already directed people to where the documentation and uh, repository is, where would that be? All right, very good. All right, the next item up, uh, we are a little bit early, but it is the OpenRTX RC-1 board. And I believe that the OpenRTX team is going to present on that. And you have the floor. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you, Michelle. I'm going to present about the RC1 uh, project. Just let, give me a minute to set up my laptop. First of all, I'm Federico, uh, and I am one of the three members of the OpenRTX uh, project. And uh, here, uh, here tonight with me uh, should be Nicolò, also connected to this call. Yes, hello to everyone. OK, uh, today we are talking about uh, one of the, the ideas that uh, came to our uh, OpenRTX uh, team. And uh, the idea is about the radio card uh, one. First of all, let's talk about what is OpenRTX for the one that uh, do, not, do not know already. Basically, it is a, a free and open source alternative firmware for digital ham radios. And uh, the idea is to develop uh, a firmware which can be used on uh, multiple uh, models, uh, types of uh, ham radio devices. And uh, we, what we want to do is to bring, uh, bring forward a community-driven development so that uh, everyone uh, with the uh, skills uh, and uh, will to, let's say, work with us uh, can uh, participate in the project and uh, submit code or bring new ideas. And also, we want OpenRTX to, to work on, uh, on as many radios uh, as possible. We don't want it to be constrained to just uh, one single model. Also, we, we would like to have some reuse of features and code across the various uh, targets, uh, the various uh, radio devices we are going to, to support. And uh, a final goal could be that uh, we, we want to, to have a software platform which can be used as a base for ham radio experimentation, which is something that is really lacking, in my opinion, because uh, the, the great part of the ham radio, let's say, any talkies or mobile radios, they feature a proprietary software which cannot be modified. And uh, there have been some, uh, some attempt, but uh, right now it was missing, I mean, a, a great software platform to experiment and act on. So this is what uh, OpenRTX uh, Open is about. And uh, right now, the OpenRTX uh, can be installed on cheap Chinese uh, DMR radios. An example is uh, the Taitera MD380 and uh, all its uh, multiple clones. And uh, also, we are uh, working right now on supporting the ALANS uh, HD1. Uh, next, uh, we, we would like to also extend the support <coughs> to Yaesu FT1, uh, FT2D radios, <coughs> which are uh, pretty cheap and, uh, and well built. So, this uh, so extending the support to these radios would be great. And uh, also in the future, we would like to, to see our, some new hardware, some radio built from scratch to, to better suit uh, the, the experimentation. Okay, 
we have to talk about hardware implementing protocols, some radio protocols in hardware or in software, because there is an important difference. Most radios that we see on the market, like uh, probably any DMR radio, they, employ, they implement the DMR protocol in a hardware way, which means that uh, there is a dedicated baseband chip. You see this uh, is, is uh, the baseband chip, the HRC5000, which is used on the MD380 radio. And basically, in these uh, types of radio, we have this chip, uh, which does uh, implement fully the DMR protocol. Well, except for the vocoder, which is uh, strangely done by the MCU. And uh, the, the most important part about this picture is that uh, the microphone and the speaker, they are connected directly to the baseband chip. So they are not connected at all to the host microcontroller, the, the MCU. So what does this mean? is that uh, these DMR radios that they do, they implement the protocol in hardware, the, the main uh, microcontroller has no way to receive the baseband signal or to even to output uh, uh, some, some audio to the, to the speaker because it's all handled by a dedicated chip. So, but uh, unfortunately the dedicated chip uh, just does the DMR. And uh, if we want to do N17 with our radio, we need to work around this limitation. What, uh, what we have done so far is to research some uh, hardware modifications, which add the missing audio pass to, the, to this radio. Basically, we add the, the MCU, the capability to receive and transmit arbitrary audio signals over the radio, and we add the ability to uh, receive microphone input and transmit speaker output. But still, up until now, on the market, it, uh, it's really missing a cheap and duckable radio because from uh, this, uh, we just said that uh, cheap uh, DMR radio need to, to have an hardware modification done before they can really be used to do, let's say, to, trans to encode arbitrary protocols. We just need on the market a radio on which you can uh, uh, do some uh, protocol research or implement uh, new protocols without having to deeply modify it. And this was uh, probably the, the question that, uh, that we were asking ourselves and uh, gave as an answer the, the idea of, of the radio card. The idea behind the radio card concept is to create a radio building block. So we want to let's say, create the minimum, the minimum working device which, can, can, which allows us to transmit and receive arbitrary protocols on the, on the airwaves. So we want to create a really minimal module and we want to give it a standardized interface so that it has some connectors, and you know how to interface with this module. And the idea is to use this core radio module on multiple applications. Some of, it, some of uh, these may be uh, an Andy Talkie, for, for example, or a mobile radio, uh, or uh, just uh, fitting it uh, into a laptop to have a, a radio modem into a laptop. Or uh, otherwise, uh, we can also construct uh, a, a repeater or, or any other application that might, might require a transceiver, a transmitter and receiver uh, uh, radio device. So what, uh, what do we want to do with this uh, 
radio minimal radio module. For the protocol standpoint, we would like to do, first of all, an analog voice. And also, of course, we would like to do some digital voice, uh, for example, with the M17 protocol. And uh, let's say we, we want to give it uh, the ability to encode and decode software protocols. So the idea is that uh, if, uh, if you want to experiment with other protocols, you should be able to do. And uh, while from the radio features point of view, we want to target uh, VHF and UHF band because uh, they are uh, the, the most uh, uh, widespread and uh, widely used band in their ham radio uh, scene, I think. And also, we want uh, this module to have uh, a low power output and uh, optional external amplifier, because uh, limiting the module to, to being low power, uh, it takes uh, us uh, off a lot of problems. For example, the, the heat dissipation or uh, the power consumption. Uh, Let's say the idea behind this is that uh, you can do a lot of stuff even without an external amplifier. So the module is useful even at low power, but there must uh, be the possibility of attaching an external amplifier if your application uh, needs it. Talking about uh, the form factor, we are uh, looking at the M.2 form factor because uh, it's really widely adopted among the development uh, boards. There are really a lot of uh, boards uh, for uh, developers uh, and makers that use this form factor. And uh, they, they are right in some sense because uh, it has a lot of, of advantages. First of all, Right now, it is the dominant uh, standard for interconnection inside laptops. Almost everything uh, that plugs uh, inside your laptop, like Wi-Fi card, uh, SSD storage, or uh, LTE modem, uses a variant of the M2 standard. Also, it gives you a lot of pins, right? Uh, maybe around uh, 40 pins. And also, if uh, we pick the M.2B key, which uh, is a particular notch configuration of the connector, if we choose this particular configuration, our module will fit in a laptop modem slot, which is really great because uh, you can uh, just uh, add a FM and uh, multi-protocol transceiver module to your laptop without, uh, without uh, doing some uh, ugly modifications. You just have uh, some predisposition by the manufacturer. OK, finally, let's talk about uh, the development of this, uh, this idea. From the architecture point of view, the architecture is, is pretty simple. Basically, we need to have a standalone radio functionality, which can interface with the outside world from one side with the M2 connector, and from the other side with the antenna connector. So the two main building blocks that we need to, to create this application is a microcontroller, which will uh, run uh, the open RTX firmware, obviously, and will take care of protocol encoding and decoding, and also uh, will take care of interfacing with uh, the other side of the M2 connector, be it uh, your laptop uh, or uh, the ND Talkie, let's say, carrier board. So we have a microcontroller uh, uh, unit and a radio chip. 
Uh, right now, we selected the ADF7021, uh, which because uh, it's the one uh, on which we got uh, so we got uh, let's say most close to do M17 uh, transmission and decoding. Uh, also, here we have uh, uh, an LNA and a, a, rece a reception amplifier, but uh, this, uh, this item is still being discussed, to whether to include it in the module or to use a separate, uh, let's say, to put it outside the module. Okay, we are, uh, we are developing this other project using uh, the KiCAD open source uh, EDA and uh, the schematic uh, is uh, mostly done because uh, most of uh, the, the connections are, uh, are complete. But uh, for, uh, for the layout, uh, we are uh, still early in the work. But uh, also probably because uh, we don't want to commit uh, to start uh, working on the layout until we are quite sure that we have the final schematic, because otherwise we risk uh, uh, having to do it uh, from scratch. So right now we are still uh, trying to finish the schematic. And uh, finally, here are the, the three open points, uh, uh, which are questions uh, to which we haven't found yet an answer. The first of all is uh, the silicon shortage problem. Uh, that uh, causes uh, basically the microcontroller we have selected and the radio chip, uh, which are uh, hard, uh, really hard to obtain. And this has, uh, in, in sort of uh, discouraged us to uh, commit to complete the schematic and to do production, because uh, if we cannot uh, buy one of the two main chips, uh, we cannot even, uh, let's say, build the final prototype. Uh, other than that, uh, we, are, we have still to, to decide what will be the uh, low noise ampl amplifier and power amplifier uh, multiplexing configuration. So whether to put uh, the two amplifiers inside the module, outside the module, or uh, one inside the, and the other side, and uh, how to manage uh, the connection and the, let's say, selection of the two amplifiers. This is still uh, being debated. And also, we, we have some doubts about the, the ADF7021 uh, uh, usability in, uh, in this application, because uh, uh, Wojciech has, uh, has designed a development board for this radio chip, but uh, he still hasn't got uh, some promising uh, results from it. So we still uh, are not, we are not uh, sure, 100% sure that uh, this uh, radio chip is uh, suitable for our application. Okay. Um, my presentation is finished. So if there are any questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, the floor is open for questions and also chat if you have a, um, some sort of a, 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 a very technical question, then it might be better in chat. But please, uh, the floor is open for questions. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, Federico, the excellent presentation. Uh, very interested pro in the project question I have for you, uh, you mentioned the desirability for compatibility with the M2B uh, slot typically used by the uh, WLAN or the Wi-Fi part of the circuit board. I'm not sure which, but my concern is the antenna. Uh, generally, I wouldn't think that the WLAN or Wi-Fi have the correct mm, uh, antenna design built into a laptop for VHF or UHF signals. Do you envision any, uh, how, how would you envision possibly utilizing that or is there a separate antenna gonna be required? Okay, thank you, Daniel, for the question. Uh, you are exactly right. Uh, in particular, 
The B key I was mentioning is the one used by the uh, modem, like uh, cellular modem in laptops. And uh, usually laptops that have, uh, uh, how do you, let's say a predisposition for this kind of modems, they also include antennas, cellular antennas, which are uh, usually placed in the laptop screen and the cables end up near to the modem slot. But uh, I think that uh, definitely we can't use uh, these built-in antennas because they are tuned to be in the range of cellular networks. So this uh, point of uh, placing an antenna in a usable position for the radio card inside a laptop is, uh, is still a problem which we haven't uh, figured out yet. But uh, I think uh, there are uh, two, two possibilities. A, a first possibility is to use a pigtail connector that uh, plugs into the radio card module. And you can, uh, let's say, uh, bring it outside your laptop, maybe using a hole, for example, the Kensington hole. For, uh, for the keychain. And uh, this way you will have a connector outside this, uh, the, your laptop, which may be a solution. Another solution could be uh, finding some patch antennas, so uh, like antennas which are built of uh, PCB. And uh, these could be embedded uh, on the backside of the laptop, but uh, this solution is really less than optimal. Excellent, Anth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Hey, I have a question from um, the Uplink team over on uh, P4DX, and, and they were interested to know um, about whether or not you would consider the AXM0F243 um, uh, chip for this sort of sort of work because it looks like it might be a, a decent match. Uh, actually, I I really don't know this chip, so we definitely haven't considered uh, it. Is the AXN zero F two four three right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. Then I maybe uh, you can you can tell us if it might might help out in uh, in some of the ways or be a parallel path forward. Uh, okay, okay, but uh, oh, wait, uh, just uh, realized that we actually have had a look at it. Uh, it is a really cool chip because it integrates uh, a microcontroller and uh, a AX5043 radio chip. So it's uh, like a combined microcontroller and radio chip. And this is very cool because it will uh, let us uh, complete the radio card with a single chip instead of two. But uh, since uh, the chip uh, it includes uh, to use uh, to, let's say, transmit analog FM, uh, we have to use the, a special mode uh, which is uh, hidden in the data sheet. Uh, so I, my fear is that uh, this combined chip uh, doesn't have the capability of uh, transmitting analog FM uh, modulation. But uh, we can uh, for sure uh, uh, look, uh, look into it uh, because it might be a really good match. Thank you for the suggestion. OK, sure thing. Can I add something? Of course. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I've got some experience with AX5043, and it looks like uh, it can run something that uh, I would call a VCO mode. So it, it's able to uh, transmit continuous wave uh, and it has two differential inputs, just ADCs, that can be fed with base band. And uh, I have already confirmed that M17 works in TX mode uh, on that chip. But the problem is that uh, the receiver part, uh, it's not very good because um, the output level is either very low or uh, is very quantized. Uh, so it's not a very good chip after all. For TX, is very good. But for RX, it's not very good. And that's it. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, that I makes a lot of sense, since the chip was being looked at uh, for uplink um, 
So, so that was where the focus was. Um, but thank you very much for the feedback on the receiver. Um, okay. I, oh, and by uh, the way, uh, I have... go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I have ordered uh, two evaluation boards for CC twelve hundred. So that's uh, also an RF chip, uh, which looks better than uh, AX fifty forty three because it doesn't use uh, analog input for the baseband, and instead you can use. Um, you can use SPI to write or read from a register and set the frequency uh, using this method, using digital SPI. And uh, uh, what is better than uh, that AX5043 is that uh, it uses internal, uh, let's say, uh, up sampler. So we, there is very minimal uh, spectral splatter from that chip. So it should be able to transmit M17 and as well as receiving it. So for me, it's a good fit. So let's see. I should uh, receive it on Monday from Mauser. So let's see. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Any other comments or questions? Please, you have the floor. Uh, one more question, Federico. Uh, I'm not familiar with your project. What are the target data rates you are hoping to achieve in the VHF or UHF bands? Um, okay, for uh, I, I, it really depends on 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 the protocol. I our target uh, protocol were uh, M17 and like. APRS. So I think uh, the data rates uh, required by M17 might be a, a suitable, uh, a suitable, uh, let's say, target requirement for that. Thank you. Maybe Nicolò knows more. No, yeah. Uh... Anyways, we are uh, targeting uh, narrowband protocols uh, with uh, low data rate uh, for now. Um, that's because it simplifies uh, the choice uh, of uh, the, the radio module. But uh, uh, if uh, basically uh, an application for uh, a higher data rate uh, comes into mind, uh, we can still uh, uh, either uh, uh, study the, the, the the use case or uh, try to uh, derive uh, a, a different, uh, let's say, design uh, reusing uh, the similar components. Um, the whole um, project tends to be uh, open hardware and uh, the software we will write will be open, open source. So uh, we also aim to be the basis for a future uh, development which uh, uh, could uh, take also different directions. All right, fantastic. Okay, we are ahead of schedule and we have presenters that will be here uh, in about 43 minutes. It'll be 1100 hours my time, uh, US Pacific. So uh, it's open discussion. The room is open and, and please uh, feel free to hang out. We will resume our uh, formal presentation schedule at 1100 Pacific. And uh, thank you. We'll, what we'll do next is uh, talk about the end-to-end -end demonstration for Phase 4DX or P4DX. Uh, this is a, a microwave band um, a digital multiplexing transceiver project intended for both space and terrestrial. Um, on the 5 gigahertz band, it is a frequency division multiple access link up. And the base digital protocol, our native protocol, is the M17 protocol. Um, once those signals are transmitted up to the to payload or to ground sat, then it is uh, turned into a DVB-S2 signal, a time division multiplexing signal down on 10 gigahertz. So there's plenty going on with FPGA development and demonstrations and all sorts of fun things with forward error correction. After that is a discussion about our work on, uh, we're anticipating work on polar codes. Um, these are very exciting codes, uh, and there's lots of peril in working with them because they are also used in 5G. So we have plenty of patent issues to, to look at and some regulatory and re legal efforts to, to clear. Uh, but our intent in order to support the technical side of this is to enable a MATLAB workflow so that people in universities 
that are working on um, uh, publishing in Polar Code area will be, have some f familiar resources at Remote Labs. So those are the things that will come up in about 42 minutes. And until then, uh, please feel free to take a break or discuss anything you like here on this particular uh, conference. See you in a bit. Hello, Fred. Don't have your audio yet. Let's see if I can fix that from here. Now it shows you're not muted. Okay. Oh, there I'm you go. On, oh, yes. hi there. Hello, welcome. Well, thank you. I'm very sorry for the difficulty you had in- No, no um, problem. I appreciate that we're on, thank you. Yeah, no, if you'd like to talk a little bit, uh, we have the recording is still running. Um, okay. And then we'll, we have about 10 minutes before uh, they would pick back up, but uh, I think that everybody would be, totally okay with you uh, presenting or talking about anything you'd like. Um, well, I'm primarily listening and willing to answer questions if there are any. Oh, very good. Yeah, we had a, a discussion about the root raise cosine uh, filter work on um, uh, for, for resource restricted hardware. Um, so I'll make sure that you hear what uh, Wojciech uh, said. Okay, um, thank you. So that's that's essentially the the area, and then it, of course anything else uh, you'd like to comment on. I think what we have coming up next is um, oh stuff that you 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 know a bit about the end-to-end uh, uh, -end demo and LDPC encoders, um, mm -hmm. and then a little bit about polar codes. So we're trying to look at polar codes, although we're our, we do have some concerns on the patent side to on how much we can get away with in terms of open source. And right. our uh, method of attack here is to use MATLAB all the way through to HDL coding uh, on the remote lab de development stations that are all Xilinx ultra scale mm -hmm. devices. So that's the stuff that's coming up here in 10 minutes. Okay, good. I'll be stepping in and out. I've got another Zoom. Oh yeah, no problem. School. Okay. Yeah, and, and no problem. And uh, if all goes well, this is recorded, so you can so oh, you can watch good. it later. Thank you. So, <laughs> yeah, thank happy you, to. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. All right, Thomas and Andre, you have the floor. Whoever would like to present first, open discussion or discuss uh, advisory issues, uh, please uh, proceed. Um, okay, uh, Andre, do you have a, a presentation you're going to show? Um, yeah, I was. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. By the way, so um, so I'm going to start with the. Um, so well, this is the diagram as it appears in the spec, um, and I'm going to start with the RF RF side here, and essentially everything to the right of this um, is platform dependent, so it's out of the scope. Uh, the current implementation starts with the stream adaptation here, so the scope of the encoder as of today is the baseband scrambler, uh, fact encoding, bit mapping, physical layer framing, um, and modulation. Uh, right now, we don't have padder or physical layer signaling or pilot insertion, um, but we do plan to insert to add those as well. Um, um, so next thing is how do we interact with it? Uh, so let me open my notes just a second. So, uh, so the encoder receives baseband frames in the inputs and produces modulated physical layer frames at the output. Uh, the interface we chose is access stream for both. Um, the input stream interface carries the configuration for the frame, um, and we have frame length, constellation, and code rate. So these three make up what I call frame attributes, um, and they define you know, how the frame should be processed in the system. The remaining parts make up a, a regular access stream. <clears throat> the output interface is very similar, um, but without the frame-based parts. Um, for example, at this point, data has been modulated, so empty data is going to have I and Q components. Uh, besides these, we have um, an axialite interface for memory map register access. Um, this register space has essentially three main uses that are going to be configuration, status, and debugging. Um, we need to configure bitmapper tables. We can enable dummy or disable dummy frame insertion. Um, and we need to 
right filter coefficients. Um, status and debugging are for things like uh, monitoring behavior, controlling flow of data, and, and that applies to several points in, in, in several internal interfaces. Um, we can, for example, check how many flight frames in flight we have. Um, I don't know, biggest, smallest frame that has gone through a certain stage. Um, we can also block data, um, block the stream at a point and allow one word or one frame at a time to see how the system behaves. Uh, the timing of the of input and output looks like this. Um, in this example, the input frame is configured as short frame QPSK code rate on four one fourth. Um, the receiver, sorry, the encoder receives this and at some point is going to write the output frame. Um, and by the way, this is what I mean when I say parameters are constant during the frame, as in the values in the ports are constant while data has, is being transmitted. Um, the last thing on the intro is how the system looks like. So this is a high level block diagram of the encoder itself um, as it's implemented in RTL. Um, and these red blocks here are the stream debug stuff that um, will allow blocking data stream and allowing one word, one frame at a time. <clears throat> a key difference of this diagram um between this diagram and the functional uh, diagram of the spec is oops oops is the presence of this frame fifo um besides the bits interleaver and it's going to be used for qpsk because qpsk has no bits interleaving yeah just a second so every every block in the system looks similar to this um, and most dvb specific blocks will also have frame attributes um but the thing is we cannot chain them like this because for example this block this green block on the right um has nowhere to get um frame attributes from so to support every frame having a different configuration we need to transport this configuration alongside the frame itself and we do this by using um axi tid interface uh, in this case the arbitrary data is the configuration of the frame <clears throat> Um, in this gray block, for example, we need frame length, consolidation, and code rate. So we decode TID. Oh, crap. So we decode TID to extract, um, and everything you know, just works. Uh, we can use this to transport anything that's constant during the frame. Um, and that makes it simple to connect multiple components. Um, so this is uh, like the top level, and you can see that the frame configuration here um, is encoded. Um, into an STID vector, and that's how it's transported throughout the design. Um, so yeah, this concludes the, the intro stuff. <clears throat> um, so stepping into the baseband scrambler. Um, so the baseband scrambler is it, it's a nice first block to look at first uh, because it's very simple. So this is the text in the spec. I'm not going to read. So I'm just going to highlight like the key things are there is a um endianness we need to follow uh, the baseband scrambler has a feedback shift register with a, sh um, a certain polynomial and we need to load this shift register shift register with um a specific sequence um, at the beginning of every frame um so the spec provides a diagram that is very close to the rtl implementation and um, like this is the 15-bit shift register and data moves uh, from the left to the right every time a data bit comes in and um, so uh, we take bits 14 and 15 and end them and um, sorry and add them together uh, to get uh, the new value of bit one um, and to get the output we only we only need to XOR bit one of the lfsr with the data input um, so the wait no, the block diagram is simple um, we have the LFSR with an initial value um, so the LFSR is going to be reset when the system is re reset as in the master reset or power on reset or when ST last T last is asserted and that indicates this frame completed so we reset the LFSR in preparation for the next frame um, bit zero then is XORed with um, the input data that produces 
the output data. Um, yeah, I'm just going to skip this. Uh, so back in coding, uh, just a second. Um, so FAC encoding subsystem is made of uh, three components, the BCH encoder, LDPC encoder, and bits interleaving. So looking at the BCH encoding, um, so it takes a baseband frame as an input and appends a parity check code to it. The size of this parity check code is given indirectly in the spec. Um, the size depends on frame length and code rate. Uh, the size of the BB frame is given in this, Sorry, the size of the BB frame is given in the this column, which has uh, it, it's essentially BCH encoded block, um, and the size of the fact the BCH fact code word is then you know the difference between the BCH coded block and the BCH uncoded block, um, and to actually calculate the parity, um, the parity check code we use a set of polynomials. And so frame length and code rate identify which polynomial index should be used. And this in turn identifies the polynomial itself. So usage encoder block diagram, and I'm, I'm going to stop using like individual um, lines. I'm just going to um, coalesce them together. And um, so uh, wait. Yeah, so the CRC MUX does the core CRC calculation, and that includes selecting the appropriate polynomial. So um, this block has a constant latency. So um, to make our life easier, uh, we add this access stream delay here at the bottom um, to delay the data for um, the same amount. So when when data arrives at the output MUX, you know, it's easy to choose where to out, which one to output. And um, also the CRC MUX block has no back pressure, which means this dashed line is literally like a tap. We don't need to replicate streams and manage back pressure. It's just rep, um, literally tapping off. Um, so if we can look at this um, from the data flow point of view. Oh, sorry, I forgot one. Um, uh, uh, oh yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, when a frame completes, uh, we need to multiplex between um, the data that is passing through by this access stream delay and the data that the, the parity data. So essentially, when they when the frame completes, we count how many um, output words we need to put to write um, the parity bit parity code word. The parity bit parity code word is usually bigger than the data width. Uh, and we convert using this ship register. Um, so yeah, now looking at the data flow. So uh, wait, yeah, the baseband frame flows through the output um, directly and through the, CRC, through the CRC block. So yes, the CRC mux. And once STLS is asserted, uh, indicating that the input frame completed, we count the number of words needed to shift data from the CRC flip-flop to the output through the shift register. Um, and by the way, this CRC uh, blocks here are auto-generated. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I plan to put a link to the ones I used, um, but essentially any auto-generated CRC block with the, the correct configuration should work here. Um, then moving on to the LDPC encoding. Um, so this is the most complex block in the system, but I think it's the most interesting. Um, so the FAC encoding subsystem receives a baseband frame, adds a BCH FAC code, and an LDPC FAC code. Uh, this spec gives the size of each of, of it. Spec gives the size of each one of these blocks in the same table as the BCH stuff. Uh, the size of the LDPC FAC code word is given by the difference between the LDPC coded block and the LDPC uncoded block. And the LDPC encoded block size only depends on the frame, really. But the LDPC uncoded block depends on um, frame length um, and code code rate. Um, uh, yeah, this is the, the text for 
LDPC encoding in the spec, but um, so I'm not going to read this. <laughs> um, I'm going to so I, I made like a series of slides to um, show this uh, LDPC encoding in a minute or so. <laughs> so let me wait. <clears throat> so we start with a data frame. So this data frame has a certain length. Um, for the matter of this example, it, it, the length doesn't matter, but the spec refers to this as KLDPC. So this frame is divided into 360 bits, uh, in groups of 360 bits each. Um, and the parity bits will be stored in a memory that I'm going to call parity memory. Um, and each data bit will be XORed with the values pointed by offsets given by the parity bit address table. So each group of 360 bits will use one row from the parity address table like this. So um, the first bit of the first group uses row zero. And I'm, 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 so I'm, I'm putting some numbers just to, so these are arbitrary numbers um, just to help visualize. <clears throat> Uh, so bit zero will be added, that is XORed, in offsets 3, 5, 7, and 11. <clears throat> uh, the second bit also, use, also uses row zero, but we add Q to the offset. And Q is a, an integer that is function of frame length and code rate. And for this example, let's say Q equals 3. So for bit 1, the offset is going to be um, 3 plus 3, so 6, Fla 5 plus 3. 7 plus 3, and then 11 plus 3. The third bit is the same, except instead of adding Q, we add 2Q. So 3 plus 6 here, and then, yeah, the others. The remaining bits of this group will use the same process over row 0, um, incrementing the multiplier of Q each time. And the remaining groups will use the same process, but um, we have the, uh, their associate rows, and we reset the Q multiplier to zero every time we get a new row. So once all groups finished, um, the parity memory, memory will have almost the, the fact code word. So for the next step, we only look at the parity memory. So we take a sliding window of two. Sorry. Um, so we end. We, yeah, we add these together to get one bit of the final code word. Then they slide the window by one to get the next bit. Um, and essentially do this for the entire memory. And that will give the final output, final LDPC code word. And that's the thing that is going to be then appended to the to the frame. Um, so, the LDPC encoder, so I'm going to divide and conquer, right? So there is a, the LDPC table that is responsible for essentially unrolling the table. So it will pick the correct base table and add Q, appropriately track the 360 bits group and all of that. And yeah, essentially unroll parity bit addresses. And the LDPC core will do the actual calculation. <clears throat> so. Looking at the LDPC table first, um, so this is, it's nice to separate um, because a dedicated module makes testing way easier. Um, be, well, there is 21 tables. There is varying number of coefficients in each table, but essentially there is like six and a half thousand coefficients. And each coefficient is 16 bit wide. Um, so, and, and we also need to unroll the tables on the fly. Um, like we, one of the alternatives I considered was basically unrolling the table and then storing that, uh, but it's prohibitively, prohibitively big, so it, it, it's not feasible. Um, so um, it doesn't matter what the tables are, <laughs> uh, but they all sort of look like this in the spec. So this is one a code rate of one fourth, a third, three fifths, and two thirds. So if we look. I don't know if we just zoom into this, it's going to have two sections. Uh, the one at the top is 12 by 15. So 12 rows of 15 values each. And the bottom is 30 by 3. Um, the next um, table looks 
it looks similar. So 12, 20 by 12, and then 12 by 3. And yeah, the next one is the same, but 36 by 12 and 72 by 3. And in fact, um, all tables have two sections. Um, the number of rows and columns is constant in each section. Um, and we can use this to our advantage to build a generic table reader. <clears throat> so we store the shape of each um, table in one memory that I'm calling metadata memory. And we flatten all the tables themselves into another memory. And that's going to help a lot with um, resource usage. Um, and how that works is, so suppose this is a table. Um, I'm just keeping it small to, you know, keep simple. So we are separating the shape into one side and the, sorry, the data in one side and the shape in, in the other side. Um, and, you know, when we separate the data, uh, we flatten them. Um, we're, we're, yeah, we're going to see in a second how that looks like. So if I have a memory that has this somewhere, I need to know where this the table starts, what's the size, the shape of the first region, and the shape of the second region. Okay. Um, and suppose I don't know, another table looks like this. We do the same. Um, and again, we're going to need you know, where this table, we, we need to know where this table starts. And this, the shape of the of the first region and then the shape of the second region. And yeah, we keep doing this for all tables. And in the end, we're, oh, sorry. Um, to unroll the table, we also need the values of Q. And so they sort of fit, fit naturally in the metadata table as well. So to unroll, so in the end, we're going to have all flattened parity address tables placed continuously in one room. And all the metadata is stored in a much smaller room. Um, and the net result is, you know, the parity bit address table memory is around 100 kilobit. And it's going to use seven block RAM 18s, um, which is good. It's not, not bad. The devices have, I don't know, hundreds of these. Um, the metadata memory is much lower, much lower usage is around one kilobit. Um, and it's usually mapped to LUTs, lookup tables. Um, is, yeah, for reasons. <laughs> That's just um, generally what happens. Yeah, so the LDPC table. Oh, so if how this works in hardware. So uh, frame type and code rate address the metadata table. The metadata table outputs the relevant information to the what I call the unroll logic. Um, the unroll logic, unroll logic will use this information to read um, the coefficients from the parity address table and unroll them to generate the, the final offsets. Um, so, oh yeah, so unroll logic is simple. It's just a bunch of nested counters, as in I need to count this many rows, you know, this many columns. Uh, it, it's so there is always two sections. So you know, I, I, yeah, I just need to. Um, it's just counters. So yeah, I'm gonna skip this. <clears throat> uh, timing wise, so um, a single bit will start the process, um, and the LDPC table will produce one offset per clock cycle like this. Um, it will also produce another output called M next, which essentially marks whenever a row completes, um, which means um, like a new bit can be processed. So this means that, for example, this section here um, with coefficients 3, 5, 7, and 11 are related to data bit 0. And then the next one, you know, 6, 8, 10, 14 are for bit 1. Um, and so on and so forth. And these values are the same for uh, the example of the LDPC in a minute slide. So Q equals three, right? And we can see that um, when we get a new row, which means a new bit, um, the coefficients are just added by Q. So this happens here and then here and here um, and so on. So the core encoding then 
the so block diagram looks like this. Um, so this wait. Uh, this block takes data and table as inputs. The input data stream is replicated into two branches. Uh, and replicating here means um, a single stream becomes multiple streams, in this case, two. Uh, in this case, so this allows um, output, but the output mux and the input synchronizer blocks to back pressure towards um, data input. Um, so the branch on the top goes straight to the output and the other ones go through um, the input synchronizer through uh, to the LDPC accumulation. So the LDPC accumulation logic uses offsets from the LDPC table to XOR data in the associate positions um, of the parity RAM. Um, and while that's going on, it will keep the output mux selecting data from the extra stream replicate. And that is essentially the baseband plus BCH fac frame passing through. So once the input frame completes, it will switch to receive data from the post frame accumulation slash with conversion. Um, the frame RAM, yeah, the parity RAM, sorry, uses a block RAM internally and block, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And block RAM's data width uh, are naturally 16 bits, uh, technically 18 because this is C, but um, yeah, we use 16. Um, so we need this width converter from 16 to N to, um, to convert from whatever, so, sorry, from 16 bits to whatever the output width is. Um, so looking at the LDPC input synchronizer, um, yeah, we essentially use this to synchronize table offsets to data bits. So because the parity bit um, offsets are given one per cycle, um, we need to convert the input data stream to one bit as well. And this ensures that output data and output offsets um, are synchronized. Um, so <clears throat> data will pass through the width converter. It will be converted to one bit. Um, the table offset passes literally through. Um, the output will be valid when both width converter, converter and table have data like this. Um, a bit from the width converter can be consumed uh, when the LDPC table indicates a next, like I showed in the diagram, and the reader is also ready to consume that data as well. Um, and we can consume one offset from the LDPC table whenever there is a valid data bit and the reader is ready to consume this bit as well. So yeah, it's not, yeah, it's just the width converter with some end, end gates around it. And just a second. Um, the accumulation process is sort of the heart of the encoding. Um, so this block connects directly to the input synchronizer. Um, here, uh, offsets are used to read the parity RAM. And because um, each RAM address holds a 16-bit value, we divide the offset by 16 um, and use the remainder of the division to select um, which bit of the read data we need to operate on essentially. Um, so we then XOR data, input data with the appropriate bits and write the result back to memory. Um, so block RAMs have an intrinsic two cycle latency between read address and read data. Um, and this means this doing this is limited to one operation every three cycles. Um, it, which is not good, but so we can do better, right? <laughs> so if we switch stuff a little bit, um, essentially these flops here match the read, match the RAM read latency. Uh, this way we can um, decouple read and write addresses in time because uh, we don't need to hold the read address constant while read uh, while write data um, is getting ready. Um, and by the way, we, I call this pipeline now. Um, however, this two cycle latency also applies between um, 
write data and read data. I mean, this is an issue in cases where we're reading data from an address that has been written less than two cycles ago. And like data will not make it to the read port in time as we expect. And this is called a data hazard. And, and unfortunately, unfortunately, in the LDPC, this happens. But uh, so this is solved inside the parity RAM itself uh, by doing some tricks around the block RAM. <clears throat> so the actual storage is still the block RAM. <clears throat> but, but we had some flip flops um, to store pending writes, which are writes that have not yet been committed to the block RAM itself. So <clears throat> read address um, is still connected to the block RAM, of course but it's also used to check if the address being read is pending so that um, read data will always have the most up-to-date data. So in other words, um, read data can be either data from the block RAM or from one of the pending writes. <clears throat> so suppose we are reading and writing from the same address at the same cycle. So write address, write data, and read address will still go to the block RAM but we can compare the write and read addresses. And if they match, we bypass write data directly to read data. So if we're reading from an address written in the previous cycle, um, we can do the same with data after the first flip-flop and likewise for reading an address written in uh, two cycles ago with um, the second flip-flop. And then anything later than this, or over two cycles, data will just come from the block RAM itself. Um, and that is it, really. Like that, I put, like, you know, I, I just, we had time just to cover these three. We didn't cover a bit interleaver, consolation mapper, physical layer framer, and polyphase filter. Um, so currently, we, uh, we have, um, verified in simulation and hardware, um, uh, all 84 valid configuration combinations, and we're bringing up the over-the-air setup. Um, and by the way, so Michelle and Paul are doing most of the work here. Um, I wish I had more time to help. Um, at this fig image on the right is my is my local setup, um, and that is it really. I, so I put links. You know, getting involved. Um, yes, yeah, contacts for myself. And well, this is not a typo, right? There is a story, <laughs> but it, it's different from my last name, but it's not a typo. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. Um, any advisory discussions, please uh, take the floor. And if there's any technical questions, go ahead and put them in chat. And uh, if you have any uh, follow-up later on, uh, uh, know that uh, this will be, uh, if all goes well, this is recorded and will be edited up and up later today. Um, and you can continue to, to reach out and ask questions about what you've seen. Um, but uh, I'll turn the floor over to anybody that would like to ask any, or give any advice or have any advisory input or any high-level questions. And then uh, please uh, ask any technical questions in chat. Uh, Dr. Soto, this is Daniel. Oh, hi, hi. Hi. Uh, I was a little confused at the beginning that the forward error corrections, well, a lot of the error correcting code is listed as FEC. I, I, am I to understand that's forward error correction? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. But yet they're being inserted after the fact. So I, I got confused because how is the forward error correction? Oh, yeah. yeah, how does that work exactly? It's being inserted afterwards, not forward. Uh, it's for I, so I'm not an expert uh, on this. I, I basically read the spec, <laughs> okay. but my understanding is you add the error correction stuff before you send over the air, so the yeah. receiver, oh. will, yeah, can use it will essentially like receive more information. Correct. So if there is like eruption, it will um recover so like there's bit interleaving that yeah. after the 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 fact that will essentially distribute the fact codes around so if you lose a burst mm -hmm. like you lose part of right. the error correct you don't lose everything 
you can recorrect. So the, the, how much latency is in the spec then? Because we're doing that. In other words, you're holding up the data that you have, not transmitting it until you calculate the forward error correction bits, and then sending the forward error correction bits first, and then the data. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the spec that's, uh, adds, that it adds latency? Uh, I think there might be. I'm not too sure, to be honest. Like, there is use cases. But yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure. Okay, no problem. Thank you. I can I can I can write this down. Latency. And look it up um, later on. Yeah, any any sort of manipulation of the data you send out over a link, um, it, you always run into adding latency, and that's a that's a, a big trade off with any sort of uh, digital signal processing or error correction coding is uh, how much latency are you adding? Uh, so, so yes, it is a factor. And the one of the things that we do in this particular implementation is to use the short codes in, or a short frame instead of long um, in, in order to kind of address some, some latency issues. Uh, so the, the mm -hmm. question's good. It's, a, it's something that you can't get away, away from if you're, if you're doing any sort of manipulation or filtering or changing of your, yeah. uh, of your, your work, you know, then, then latency is always a factor. Uh, it's, we try to reduce it wherever we can. So in the spec itself, I couldn't find latency, <laughs> like the word latency. Right. Yeah, it's implementation specific. You'll, mm. you'll, You'll yeah. be able to, you, you could, you can implement all of this and have a lot of latency, or you can do the sorts of things yeah. that, that we do and, and reduce it. So it's, uh, it, yeah, you probably yeah. won't find it in the spec, um, you know, but there will be some in there. I think the rationale for not really addressing latency in the DVB spec is probably because it's video broadcast. And then that's, in that use case, the latency is not terribly important, uh, but maybe in other cases, uh, it certainly most certainly is. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Mm. All right. Uh, I think let's uh, we'll give the floor to, to Thomas Perry to talk about uh, his advisory opinions today. And uh, so feel free, every, everyone else, to ask questions, and then we'll we'll close with a, a short discussion about plans for Polar Codes and the MATLAB workflow in uh, remote labs. So, Thomas, you have the floor. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. I don't have a lot to say, but um, yeah, I think maybe just worth mentioning that the great work that Andre just showed um, is the some really complex um, encoding and. I think um, him and some other people in the team, um, such as Anshul, are working towards trying to test this now over the air or over coax cables, um, which will be a really, really nice milestone to get to. Um, and I think basically meets the first um, phase of phase four, if that makes sense, which having the, the over the air transmission, um, which is really nice. Um, yeah, I don't really have much more to say apart from that. Do you have anything in particular thinking of, Michelle? Uh, no, I'd like to to um, to highlight that that we we are moving uh, as quickly as we can to to prove out all of our designs over the air. Uh, our bias is that uh, it doesn't work until it's transmitted over the air, or like you said, over coax. And fortunately, we can we can transmit over the air in remote labs, and we're getting there. Uh, the The basic idea here is to take our custom open source. Um, and IP blocks, the, the, the encoder, for example, that has been discussed today, and then graft that in or include, incorporate, integrate that into the reference design from analog devices. The particular RFIC that we're looking at using is the 9371. The development board that we are using is the ADRV 9371, and this fits onto a uh, ultrascale uh, Xilinx FPGA development board called the ZC706. And these this equipment is available for, for anyone that wants to do this sort of work uh, over the internet uh, if, through remote labs at Open Research Institute. And so that's what we're provided and what we're supporting. And the, the status right now is that we have made a whole lot of progress in incorporating and integrating the IP block into the reference design from, from analog devices. We're not yet uh, transmitting over the air, 
Uh, we're working through lots of different scripting to properly integrate all of this work, and we anticipate being able to do this as, uh, over there as soon as possible. The first way that we tried to do it was to take the reference design and follow the how to integrate your IP core into our stuff from analog devices. Uh, ran into a little bit of trouble there. Uh, so so that's, that's, a, that's one front of progress. And then uh, what uh, Suatu did is to start with his block and then to pull in the reference design. Uh, and we had a, some interesting tools issues uh, with that. Uh, Vivado, which is the IDE that we're using, uh, we used 2019.1 because that's the, the latest released version for the reference design. So we've run into some interesting tools issues problems. Uh, but every day, you know, these are the things that you have to, to deal with and solve for, for sort of a complex IDE and ecosystem like this. So we're looking forward to being able to transmit this over the air. For being able to receive it, we do have some a set of commercial equipment for DBBS2. And we're, we're going to sort of require uh, any of our work to be received you know, demodulated, decoded, and proved out. Uh, you know, look at look at what you get on the other end uh, using lab gear, commercial lab gear. So if you want to learn more about that, it's those are, all the gear is listed on the remote labs section of the Open Research Institute GitHub. Uh, so when when we publish this, I'll have the link directly to that if you want to look at all the different um, all the different equipment. So the goal is, of course, to have it over the air and then to start working on the adaptive coding and modulation side uh, to start looking at uh, what we need to do in order to make this resilient as possible for space, uh, what we need to do in order to make the system as resilient and useful as possible for terrestrial. Uh, and those those may be two different things. Uh, and that's uh, that's where we're at today. All right. Um, any any questions for this particular part? Is a question about what you just uh, talked about uh, possible right now, Michelle? Of, of course. Please go okay, ahead. Okay, great. Great. I'm interested in, this, in these projects for terrestrial use, um, aerial drones, for example, and um, and they can be sort of as the technology improves, their velocities will be increasing, and there brings in Doppler shifts, and you certainly have that with a satellite. But what is sort of um, which is, and you're going to be, I'm sure you're going to be resilient on uh, with regards to Doppler shift. The question I have is just the data rates that you're expecting and actually the use of the DVB for data. I know some people have been using it, but it was really you know, uh, designed for digital video. Um, is that a, a, a good use case for data, just generic data? Yes. Uh, actually, DVB, the organization, has a protocol that we're using called Generic Stream Encapsulation, or GSE. And this is a drop-in replacement for, um, for MPEG. And so that's, that's our eventual goal is to, to use uh, GSE, uh, generic data. So what that gives you is, a, a sort of, it's, as it says, generic, uh, generic stream right. or generic data uh, and you get to you get back some of the uh, overhead that you spend on broadcast uh, MPEG stream and in terms of data rate the data rate changes with respect to to what coding and modulation you do our mm -hmm. particular design for for space or for terrestrial uh, use assumes up to uh, 10 megahertz uh, bandwidth mm -hmm. yeah and then the, you have your roll-off factor and all that um, but you can go narrower if you need to, for uh, maybe uh, if, if you're talking about uh, drones, you may not want the whole 10 megahertz bandwidth, sure. um, you know, but you fix your symbol rate and then you vary your modulation and coding uh, as needed in order to adapt to whatever path uh, you have, you know, whatever, what your environment mm -hmm. or what your channel is or what your stations in your population of users have. Some people will have powerful stations some people will not some people will have a pointing error <laughs> you know a microwave yeah, pointing is a you know and some won't some are moving and some won't um, this particular set of protocols is is resilient to doppler and is uh, is good for that we we ran through the numbers uh, all the way up to leo um, wow. and then uh, so i think mike parker was here a little earlier and he is using dvbs2 on catsat uh, uh, 10 megahertz uh, 10 gigahertz uh, downlink in the amateur Imager is part of the band um, and is, is doing so. So we've been working and, and 
collaborating with him over the past couple of years about that. So that's so that's a, a good uh, proof uh, application for for yes. DVBS two um, on, in space uh, for, in a right. in a mission. Um, so yeah, you'll you'll see the data rate will change with respect to how much coding and what how complex the modulation can be. So the data rate will change around. So you you can you can go through the table and see like if you had very low signal to noise ratio situation, your data rate will be much lower, uh, but you will be able to get through um, a, a surprisingly low uh, SNR or all the way up to some, some, if you have a boom in signal, then you can take advantage of that. Exactly. Then the flip side of that, of course, is uh, the latency. Um, is that, is that a, is there a design goal for the latency that uh, if you wanted to do real time control of the satellite, let's say, would that be possible? Yeah, traditionally the the control part of the satellite would be outside of the the traffic band, um, yeah. but we've actually talked about including it. So yes, the the you would as soon as you have a um, an implementation that you can start testing, mm. um, then you start looking at things like like latency and timing and and all of that. So so yeah, that's that's definitely on the docket. Okay, great. Thanks, Michelle. Oh, of course. All right, any other questions on this particular part? Okay, and then the final thing is that we have a ZCU 106 um, ultrascale board, and this is probably where we're going to focus the polar coding uh, part of the project. And we have, we've gone ahead and purchased um, a, a license for MATLAB. Now, uh, what we have been using for, for MATLAB is the home license, which is $150 is an excellent deal. Um, but it does not include HDL coder or GPU coder or MATLAB coder. And those are the heterogeneous processing types of uh, toolboxes. Um, and so there's a couple of things that I'm sure a lot of you are thinking. It's like, well, why in the world would you go with MATLAB and not an open source tool flow? Um, because Octave is wonderful. Um, there isn't really a replacement for Simulink, and some of the things that we want to do don't exist in the open source tool flow yet. So there's a two-pronged approach here. This is to allow open source work in polar coding to happen, and we do need to meet the people that are that are producing this work at universities and, and at some companies that actually want to participate in open source work. We need to kind of meet them where they're at. So that's one reason. Another big reason is that the both the Xilinx and companies like Analog Devices assume that you're using MATLAB and they have a lot of things bolted up to MATLAB that may, there's more of a gap between that and Octave. Um, so so meeting where people are at and, and using the right tool for the job uh, with a lot of quotes, heavy quotes around that is uh, is what we do. Being able to then quantify what it is about MATLAB that people like, uh, what what is what does it allow you to do, and then take that over to the open source tools community and say, okay, here's areas where we probably need to to focus more on the tool making side. Since our core point is uh, developing communications, uh, advanced communications uh, algorithms and, and designs and hardware for for open source. Our, our core point of, of existing is not to develop Octave. However, as an open source project, I think it's incumbent upon us to find out what those tools need to do in order to bolt up to uh, current and modern uh, parts. And so since polar codes really ought to be something that, that we as the open source and amateur communities, should, you, we should be able to to participate, use, learn, and know about as much as possible. That is why this we're doing this particular uh, area of research and development. There are some, and in addition to all of the things that I just said, the tools issues and you know, pro using proprietary tools in order to make a uh, open source stuff happen. There is another big issue with polar codes, and that is patents. So polar codes were picked and are used and exploited in uh, 5G, and there's a whole ton of sub patents. So this is an area where we are going to spend some time and effort to work out a way forward for open source polar codes. Uh, to be developed. So, so getting the the technical side of the house and the resources at Remote Lab in line, um, that's one part of the the problem. You know, being able to quantify what 
what open source tools need to do in order to to fill in this area and and to to do this sort of thing is another. And then the uh, regulatory and legal side is a third. So if you're interested in this sort of work, uh, please let us know and um, welcome aboard and we'll we'll see what we can do. We're, we're going to give ourselves a deadline of roughly a year from this week. Uh, we're in the startup program by MATLAB. So we were accepted, Open Research Institute was, was accepted into the program. And that gives us an enormous discount on the, the sorts of toolboxes that were not available, that are simply not available to the home license. So we figure we'll give it a good hard shot uh, for the next year and then publish what we find or publish along the, going all along the way, but to, to do a final report a year from now. And then um, assess whether or not we want to spend the roughly $3,600 to get all of these MATLAB tools again uh, or not. So that's the, that's the plan for the polar code. Uh, the polar coding stuff is not going to compete with the LDPC or P4DX or any uh, of the, or the M17 FPGA work, which we didn't discuss today, but is actually on the, you know, on the docket, on the deck as well. So that's a ZC706 board, and the ZCU106 is where we're looking at doing polar coding. Uh, and if we need to change that, we, we will, but the, the goal, another uh, aspect of this was not to, to compete with the uh, relatively busy uh, ZC706 uh, board where people are, are doing the LDPC encoder and eventually the LDBC uh, receiver. Uh, and so that's uh, that's it from the Polar Code side. All right, so uh, any final questions, comments, or advice? I just had a, I'm sure you thought about this, but I was curious. Um, the MATLAB or MathWorks okay with you pub or us publishing the results of the HDL, HDL coder openly? Because sometimes companies can get a bit funny about that kind of stuff. From a initial read through of all of the agreements, no, that you are good to to publish the um, the eventual work, right? So you get a, an HDL output, and then that's not really where we we're going to end things. That's just what we take, and and we will have to do a lot of work from there. Um, so so we'll have to we may run into more trouble uh, with uh, the with the fact that we're we're publishing polar code stuff rather than. MATLAB stuff, but uh, it's a good question. I didn't see anything in any of the paperwork or the or the uh, the startup agreement, um, but it's a good thing to double check. So I'll take it as an action item and go back through and, and carefully make sure that we're we're not getting into anything uh, too tricky. All right, cool. Uh, Michelle, question on the Polar Code uh, pat patent ex exclusions. The usually pat companies that are patenting codes like this, they try to be very broad in their scope. Is Has anybody identified a path that would allow the, uh, the open source polar codes development to, to be successful? Or is this still, uh, have, does that path still have to be found? I think both. So we, we know that we, um, based on the discussion at the very, very beginning, um, right before we started, uh, Paul and I, KB5MU, were talking about this. And the general approach for something like this is to, to go back 20 years and define and only use things Ooh. that are cited back 20 years. Now, for polar yes. codes, I think you can imagine that that might be challenging. Um, and and then also to look at to look at the ecosystem and see, like, you know, look at all of the things that it, all the work that is going on and and to seek uh, some some solid legal advice and to only use publish as we go to put everything out there and and right. and you know so so both and really is the you know there, yes there is a general approach that which may or may not be possible because I haven't looked mm -hmm. to see if there's anything that's 20 years or older and then also to just get some good advice and since there is a lot of activity in academia on polar codes there's a lot that's published that's uh you know that we can we can cite. Um, mm -hmm. But this is going to be um, high wire, sort of. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, things worth doing are rarely easy. And this is definitely sure. not an easy thing to do because it's uh, it's not just a difficult technically and rewarding technically, um, but it's also uh, very much a, a patent encumbered area. So mm -hmm. we have lots of work here to do over the next year. 
well, look, uh, wish you success. Wish success. It's going to be quite. It's a very technical area, and there may be different interpretations. Yes. That right, and so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we will take all yeah. the uh, good wishes that we can get, and we'll yeah. just give it a good hard uh, hit, and um, and then we'll publish everything you know uh, that we that we find. That, you know, if it's right. a if it turns out to be absolutely insurmountable, then we'll describe exactly how why it is yeah, exactly. and why. So, and then you know maybe uh, we can from there. You know, it could there can be um, uh, future work. So. Sure. Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. I have a question for the group. Go ahead. Uh, from the remote lab point of view, we'll be soon installing these MATLAB tools onto a virtual machine for people to, to use. And it's unclear to me whether it's desirable to have it on its own separate uh, virtual machine so that it doesn't interfere at all with FPGA development on uh, hardware or whether it needs to be on the uh, same virtual machine with the ZCU set uh, 106. So any opinions or experience on that would be welcome here. I don't know yet. My instinct is that the, the MATLAB toolboxes are gonna need to interact with Vivado and my gut instinct was that we should install MATLAB on Karapi, which is the virtual machine that is currently connected up to and, and runs the ZC106. We do have access to technical support, um, which you we haven't up till now using the, the home license. So this might be something that we go ahead and try and do a couple of hello world uh, simple uh, examples that are that are built into um, built into the MATLAB toolboxes that we want to use, and then see what happens. And then if it blows up or we have significant problems, then we go to technical support and ask them how they view this uh, this installation or this setup to be. So that was my general, high, very high level sort of approach to this. Also, I have a couple of people at universities to ask. I know that universities install, uh, you know, an educational license in MATLAB and are doing similar things to what we want to do. So we we should, within the the community, uh, be able to ask for some advice and and help on, you know, hey, gee, how do you how do you set this up to where it'll work with with hardware, um, and then the related tools that are that are needed along the way. Okay, if nobody else has any uh, thoughts on that subject, we'll try to do it one way or the other and see how it works out. Yeah, I, I think we like we need people using to see like I, I don't have um, the um, the vision or you know I don't understand enough about my, how MATLAB interacts to to be able to tell now. Yeah, me neither. I've only I've only yeah. used it on individual computers, but you know, I'm I'm pretty this is we'll be able to figure it out and we'll do whatever yeah. it takes to get it to to work. I'm I'm assuming that what we that we'll be able to pull it off and get it uh probably has to be on the VM, may have to be some sort of tailored installation and we'll, and we'll we do have um access to to some customer support and some technical support. So, I'm I'm optimistic. I think it'll work out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In some way or another. Exactly. <laughs> some way or another. <laughs> cool. Okay. Any any last questions or advice? Uh, this is Daniel again. One more question is when should when the when will the next presentation like this one take place? I would defer to Thomas Perry since um, the quarterly technical advisory committee is is, uh, is his uh, initiative, and I would defer to him on it. Uh, but we'll probably have it in a quarter, I think. What do you think, Thomas? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I don't know about the exact um, dates or anything, but yeah, roughly a quarter would stick with the naming convention. Yeah, yeah, at sure. least once a quarter. But we also do have. Um, we have focused meetings like for the FPGA team, uh, that's weekly on Tuesdays. And we also try to do office hours um, 
So I, I try to do them and a couple of other people try to do them. So, so this, you won't have to wait a quarter, uh, but definitely this, this type of meeting uh, will happen in another quarter. Uh, but for office hours, just look, uh, if you're not already on the mailing list for uh, Open Research Institute for the phase four ground team, then that's, that's our main announcement list. And if you're on Slack, then the, uh, the office hours get posted there. Uh, so, so that's the advice I have. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, sure thing. Okay, thank you, everybody. We will close here at uh, it's noon my time, and we will edit and post this recording as soon as we can. If all goes well, it might be today. And there will also be some materials and some slides um, from throughout the the day. Uh, the, those materials will also be made available. So uh, we'll, we'll post an announcement about that everywhere. We usually post things like on Twitter and our, our Slack and, and our, our mailing list. So thank you again. And I will close the meeting uh, and see you next time.